Our next group is Firm 20. And their project, and their project is iPad application, My Law Ontario. Welcome Cheryl Beige, Erdell Koch, Matthew Marini, and Daniel Salama. Good afternoon, my name is Cheryl Beige, and my colleagues are Matthew Marini, Daniel Salama, and Erdal Gok. And again, our submission is for an application called My Law Ontario. For Canadians, access to justice represents a growing challenge. This challenge is only amplified by the increasing cost of legal services. There has been now an explosion of self-represented litigants, especially in civil, criminal, and family law. However, legal system is complex for individuals without a legal training because there are various rules, steps, and filing requirements. It is very hard for self-represented litigants to cope with this complexity. We provide self-represented litigants with the tools and training through an iPad application, which is named my Law Ontario. By the guidance of this application, self-represented litigants will have to will be able to go to court and handle their legal issues. In other words, they will achieve fair results from the law in a faster, cheaper, and more effective, more effective way. Finally, self-represented litigants will have their chance to be heard. So uh, our goal is to build a resource that instructs and demonstrates to self-represented litigants how to navigate uh, certain aspects of the legal profession. Uh, with regards to uh, sort of specifics, we'll be looking at four main sections. Uh, the first is uh, My Law Ontario for family. Obviously, that'll be for family court issues. My Law Ontario Civil for civil litigation issues. My Law Ontario Criminal for the self-represented litigants uh, in the criminal system. And My Law Ontario Wills for the drafting of wills and all other sort of wills and estate issues uh, that we can get into. Uh, just in terms of uh, what will happen when you log on at first, um, you'll be greeted with a video character. We hope one less annoying than the Microsoft Paperclip. Um, the idea being that for, to take my family law as an example, uh, the first video will seek just to introduce the basics of the family court system, determine uh, what issue the client is dealing with, and uh, to reassure the self-represented litigant that in this example, for instance, it's a heavily emotional process, it could be one of a lot of stress and fear, and uh, to reassure them that they're not alone, the things they're feeling are understandable, and that this is the first step in, in like we said, in a, in a process. Okay, after the first video, they'll be directed through a series of questions. For family law, it would be any question that a lawyer would ask in their first interview. They'll be asked where they live, when they were married, when they were separated, all of that will be dealt with. Those, that information will actually go directly into the forms, and there will be user-friendly forms that would, they will also be guided through later on, and it will direct them what information needs to be gathered. There will be checklists and alerts for the individuals to deal with, and it will tell them where they are through the legal system, what process they're in, and where they have to be alerted to, what dates need to be dealt with, and it will go directly to their text message or to their email. On-demand videos accompanied by printable resources will be available to individuals at each step to help them understand where they are in the legal process and what they need to do next. For example, explaining the general processes of a divorce, 
to how to complete and file the documents, while also making it clear what each step means and why it's important to the larger process. For a low per use fee on a limited time and limited scope basis, individuals will be able to interact with a lawyer live via webcast. Using the same model, they will also be able to submit these documents they've created using this app for review and feedback from the lawyers to see if there's anything that needs to be corrected or added. In conclusion, our goal is to provide a support system to the self-represented litigant. We intend to not just tell them what they need to do, but show them how they are to do it. We'll provide the tools and confidence to the self-represented litigant so that they can find their voice to be an effective advocate for themselves. In doing so, we can break down the social, economic, and geographic barriers to ensure individuals can achieve a fair and just result from the law in a faster, cheaper, and more effective way. Thank you. So basically you guys are a uh, paid YouTube channel for self-litigation. Is that it? <laughs> or I would say that, uh, that's one aspect of it. Uh, we've seen actually in the LPV program uh, the, the uh, how helpful it can be to have, as you said, essentially a YouTube video explaining how to do. Anyone who's had to tie a tie in the morning without knowing how uh, can see the that advantage works. of things like but, but certainly in addition to that, as we said, there's issues of documentary review, there's um, uh, explaining procedurally how to go through things, there'll be so, interactive elements as well. So as a, uh, someone who's ignorant to the uh, uh, financial constraints of being a lawyer, um, the group before you spoke about a, uh, a requirement that says if you pay a lawyer, a lawyer, um, it, you can only pay one person for the legal services. Now, you're talking about applying a fee to a, uh, a group of lawyers. I, I would assume that would be available. So how are you making the money if the money, if you can only pay the lawyer that is providing the services to you? So the initial idea, and admittedly none of us are finance majors, but the idea is sure. that the application itself would have a cost. And the cost from the people initially buying that application would be what we use to run the program. And then as the individuals require that extra assistance, that one-on-one, -on -one, that document review, that's the money that would go to the lawyers that do that work. But from our end, it's the actual selling the access to the software. Got it. I, I'm um, just curious to know, um, in the, in the family law, because that's my area. Um, this is all focused on court. I would love, well, A, if my clients could afford an iPad, I don't have one, but um, I would love that there be more information about the you know, family law itself as opposed to just getting them ready to go to court, because I think that's a problem in the system right now, and I only speak about family law. So I love this idea, but I would love it more if you would put some more education front and load it in that way that might direct them to other alternatives in court. That's my comment. That's a good idea. And I just missed something, I think, in terms of the chronology again. At what point do you start giving some kind of interactive advice as opposed to presentation on sort of style or, or forms initially? At what point is there an advice component? So that's something that'll be left up to the individual using the software because it is an extra fee to access those services. So as they're working through completing their documents, getting ready, if they run into any difficulties, they can at any time uh, access those additional services. I see. Okay. Thank you very much. Firm 20. I don't think the legal profession is going to be quite the same after you all get out there. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. So our next firm is Firm 21. And their project, their project is technology, the gateway to the delivery of faster, cheaper, more efficient justice. Welcome Yusuf Bakit, Alison Gorham, Francis Marinick Jaffer, and Raminbir Sandhu. Good evening, we are Firm 21. 
Uh, I'm Allison, and my colleagues Yusuf, Fran, and Remy. <clears throat> Mr. Bakit, I just got my bill, and this is outrageous. You're charging me $1,200 just to submit a motion in court? You have to understand that I spent in court almost six hours just to submit your motion. And I'm giving you a deal. I <laughs> I'm only charging you for the time I spent in court. I excluded my preparation time. Wait, wait. Six hours? Just to submit a measly motion? That seems ridiculous. I mean, I don't understand. You said this was an uncontested motion and there was no opposing counsel. What were you doing in court? And why am I the one footing the bill? This is a process. I can't just stroll into court, walk into a judge and submit your motion. I have to wait in court until the matter is called. And that happens when it happens. That's the way it is. I can't afford this. I mean, I wish there was another way. <laughs> there could be another way. There could be another way. <laughs> Technology plays an ever important role in our lives. Why not in the legal profession? We can use our phones to pay bills, transfer funds, share photos, and make dinner reservations, but we're still sitting around in a crowded courtroom just for 15 minutes of our time. What if we could submit motions from the comfort of our home and office? We could better serve persons with disabilities or language barriers, people who are unable to navigate through the legal system alone, and those who are financially unable to bear the cost of a lawyer. This is how it will work. The initial sign-up would be done in person to verify identification. You will then obtain a unique log uh, login and password. At this phase, the system accommodates only uncontested motions. You would then upload the motion and supporting documents electronically. We don't just talk the talk of equality and access. We are cutting edge. Our renovate, our innovation plan will incorporate the communication standards in the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. Users with hearing impairments uh, can access sign language interpreters as well as a visual feed that will mirror spoken language. These feeds will have interpretation for multi-language access. Blind and visually impaired users can access voice apps to read along with written print. Persons with cognitive and other learning disabilities will be accommodated with simple language. We are user-friendly, and our innovation is based on universal design. Our educational site offers explanations about legal process and shows users how to log into the area that meets their individual needs. A court officer will receive the submissions and will verify that all the required information is provided. If there is anything missing or incorrect, the moving party will, will receive an email notification advising that the motion is on hold until any error is corrected. They will have five business days to make corrections or additions. Otherwise, the motion will be denied for failing to respond. If all information has been provided, it is then forwarded to a judge, master, or registrar, as the case may be, who shall decide on the motion. The order made is then conveyed online to both parties. Our goal is to provide a relatively quick turnaround time. The premise is eliminating the physical waiting time in the courtroom and removing the congestion from the court system caused by minor procedures that do not require intensive input or effort. This solution embodies access to justice by creating a more affordable and more efficient legal system. This solution employs technology as a gateway for delivery of faster, cheaper, and better justice. Mr. Bakit, I just got your bill, and I think you may have undercharged me. I mean, not that I'm complaining. No. Actually, I submitted your motion online and did not spend any time in court and could get a quick turnaround in your motion. That sounds fantastic. What a cost-effective method. 
Tak. Technology really is the way of the future. Thank you. Could uh, anyone do it themselves and not go through Mr. Uh, Yusuf? Uh, yes, in our proposal we set out, um, it's an online system that would work across the board. So if, if an, a self-represented litigant wanted to submit their motions online, they would have to go in person to create their unique ID. But then once they had that, they would be able to log in themselves. Um, so if they knew what they were doing or it was very, um, very easy with a little effort, they could go in and submit it themselves and would not require going to a lawyer if they didn't want to. I've never been to court. So, uh, or, so yeah, but I know who to go to next. Um, so is this, do you need to change any legislation or any requirements in order to submit online or you don't need to be there in person? No, we need some changes in the rules of court. There okay. Rule seven, and uh, some added provision which will allow submission of motions uh, online. Okay, so your business model is based on change, changes in the legislation and, or rules, and how easy would that be, ladies? <laughs> I have my deputy attorney general here, so he can answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say this was sounding a little reminiscent of, of some of the initial changes the AG is actually looking at. Uh, not this far along, but uh, filing. Yeah. We're taking notes, and that's why, you know, Patrick is here. So all your good ideas, we are. Uh, are you going to have advice available if people need it? somewhere in the middle of representing yourself or retaining a lawyer, or are you going to have unbundled services? Uh, if I can answer that, um, prior, after you get your, your login and so forth, and you actually get into, the, into the, the, the screen, the introductory screen, there will be a way in which you could maneuver yourself to find what you need, and that would all be based on accommodations for language, as we've noted, and for people who have a variant variant disabilities so as soon as you get into it you can figure out where you need to go and you would have parallel access to all of the information. I'm more concerned about advice as opposed to information. So suppose you're not quite sure what you're, um, exactly whether, where you should be asking for X or whether you should be asking for Y. In our proposal, we indicated that if you were not a lawyer and you were a self-represented litigant and you were coming in to create your login, you would also be provided, lawyers could get it to, an information packlet that would provide information about what your issue was and, and what required you to require this motion and give you information that would provide you how to maneuver yourself, either through the website or um, through other avenues. Can I, just, I just asked one quick question. Um, these are all uncontested motions. So have you got any stats on how many uncontested motions there are as compared to contested motions? Because to set this up, I'm assuming it's going to, there's going to be a cost involved, and I'm just wondering about the cost-benefit analysis. Have you, I know you had stats at the beginning, but, but I don't think you isolated out the uncontested motions. And you may not be able to, I don't know. Yeah, and for any of the statistics, statistics that we were able to find didn't isolate uncontested from contested. In our original draft, we did include contested motions as one of the avenues. However, for an introductory phase, there's too many moving parts um, when you're taking into consideration contested motions. Um, you know, the, the moving party and then the receiving party. For an introductory type of program, we thought sticking with something that was more simpler would be more effective. And then along the road, um, if it, were, if it were successful, we could then implement um, the maneuvering to do uncon sorry, contested motions. Thank you. So thank you very much. <laughs> Firm 21. Now that I know that the Deputy Attorney General is here, we have 
the Attorney General, the Deputy Attorney General, we've got the Treasurer. Next year we invite the Rules Committee, we lock the doors and we get it all done. <laughs> So please welcome Firm 30 with their reform initiatives. We have Gillian Bowman, Lisa Renee Hazley, William Metcalf Lee, and David Senny. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Chris said, my name is William Metcalf Lee, and I am presenting affordablelaw.com. So our vision is to become the leading online marketplace for buyers and sellers of legal services by promoting comparison, unbundling, transparent pricing, and remote services to match consumers with the right lawyers. We will be the Amazon.com meets consumer reports of the legal industry. We will create a highly informed marketplace of buyers and sellers to facilitate a more perfect legal market. Unless and until the cost of legal services declines, only a very few will have affordable access to justice. The primary problem is the high cost of lawyers to access a very complex system. Solutions must be targeted to developing acceptable quality services at prices that most consumers would deem affordable. We're living in a distorted market right now. Lawyers are very expensive, $338 an hour per average. And legal aid programs are, are limited in their scope and application. The legal system is very difficult for a layperson to navigate. And only lawyers and paralegals are licensed to provide legal services. So potential non-law competitors are shut out of the market completely. There's very low price competition amongst lawyers. And it's difficult to compare lawyers, even though most tasks are commoditized by design, like appearing in court or drafting a statement of claim. Also, many consumers don't necessarily care about a law firm's brand the same way we do as law students. They would just like help from a lawyer who's competent to navigate the complex legal system. What is affordablelaw.com? It's these three things. Firstly, a database of lawyers. So we want to provide as much information as possible about lawyers to create a more perfect market. And what's very important up there are the services that the lawyers in the database provide. So whether it's flat fee or billable hour, or whether they offer unbundled services, whether they're willing to work remotely. As well, ratings and reviews, very crucial, but from former clients, not just other lawyers, not just industry groups. It's very difficult to find this information online right now unless a client had a terrible experience with a lawyer and then it's on page five of the Toronto Star. <laughs> But quantitative metrics are minimal or absent on current review websites. So we would like to provide standardized ratings for all of the things up there and let the user drill into the data that we have with search filters. And they'll also be able to prioritize the criteria that are most important to them to find the perfect lawyer. Thirdly, we're gonna have educational resources. So for clients self-representing or handling part of their case, we want step-by-step -step guides with forms, links to forms and instructions. When that's not available, we want a question and answer system on our site. So users can ask questions to practicing lawyers who will respond with general legal information. And if that's not enough, well that user now has a connection to a lawyer that they can retain and help them. We can also use the answers that the lawyers gives as a foundation for developing more guides and keep adding to it. What will be the effects of affordablelaw.com on the market. Well, we're gonna have more real competition, a redistribution of business to more efficient lawyers. Remote lawyers are gonna be competing in new geographical areas. Flat fee billing will take hold. We might even get rate schedules similar to those present in other industries, as well as unbundling, where clients can handle some of the matter themselves. Next, we'll have a better alignment between the lawyer 
and the legal issues. So consumers will find the exact lawyer they need, not a lawyer who just has basic experience, not a lawyer that they feel tied to because they spent half an hour in their office and they don't think if they go down the street they're going to get a better price, and not one that they found with low information by opening the yellow pages or picking the first link on Google. Importantly, we're going to identify and divert business from lawyers who do not serve clients well. And pardon the pun, but we are going to raise the bar for the entire legal industry. All of this is what affordablelaw.com will do. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, but the name has to go. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are aware of that. Right. We put it in the original report and then uh, couldn't change it. Reflect Sorry. and pivot. I like that. That's very good. Um, so I'm just, I, I, I'm struck here because everybody's uh, mentioning the same thing over and over again, which is uh, people representing themselves. Uh, and then you're providing them solutions to represent themselves, hence taking yourselves out of the market and not paying yourselves. Yes. So I'm trying to figure out how you're going to make money out of this. Lawyers will still pay themselves, but we do have a big problem with we're just earning too much money. And the flip side of that, I know, I'm really sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But the flip side of us earning too much money is that people have to pay too much, and when you compare it to their incomes, they simply can't pay, and there just aren't enough resources like legal aid to help them get the access to justice that they need. How would you recruit your lawyer, and why should I put my name with your company? So it is a referral service as well. It's a marketplace. It's a full marketplace of buyers and sellers. So lawyers should be willing to provide their information because when it comes to new digital media technologies, early adopters are often the ones who benefit the most. So if you are the first or the second lawyer in your practice area on that site, you might see your business um, increase drastically. As well, it's a self-reflection. So you can look at your own practice and say, this is what I'm not doing efficiently. What could I do better? Do I really need this expensive office space in downtown Toronto if clients are willing to have me work remotely? So there's, there's a whole bunch of different reasons why a lawyer might uh, buy into this system, even though they aren't, won't necessarily earn the high amount of money that they were earning before. They'll make up for it in more clients as well as more efficiency. Um, I had a, a couple of questions. One, um, you're saying that lawyers could give some general information. <clears throat> I think that was without charging. Was that was that correct? I'm sorry, I didn't catch you, the end. Oh, you had you had said at one point that a client could access a lawyer and get some general information. That's correct. My concern, I guess, is that will the client understand the difference between legal information and legal advice? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a potential problem uh, for lawyers because. Uh, we don't want to be seen to be giving legal advice when we don't really we right. haven't got a, a, um, a relationship with that client. And that disclaimer would be posted all over the place, including on those sites, that it doesn't constitute legal advice. And if you want legal advice, you have to speak to this person in person and, and go for a consultation, or you have to have a meeting with them. So that would be absolutely clear. And I guess the other thing was the rating of lawyers, which I've already expressed my discomfort about, but uh, we'll just, you know. We... Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Mine is a follow-up from that. So, how are you really going to raise the bar? How how do you know you're not just going to get a bunch of lawyers who do cut rate work that is maybe passable? So we won't say it's negligent, but it's not particularly good. How because they they want to spend less time, and so they can charge less. Why are you? Why isn't this going to the lowest common denominator in, instead? I I think we will have. Um, lawyers of all denominations um, join the site and we will have a screening process as well. This is not a free-for-all so we, our whole team will be heavily involved and if a lawyer approaches us and, and fills out the, the questionnaire that we require and we look into their background and see you know, ethics violations here and, and things like that, then it needs to be on there. The whole the point is to provide all of that information. Yeah, I, I'm just going to challenge you a bit on that. I'm sure. not suggesting people who are not ethical or anything else. I'm just, I'm just saying there's a spectrum from the gold standard to, you know, the adequate. It's We're hoping to bridge that knowledge gap with reviews from former clients because and they're the ones... And how are they going to know? 
the for we are going to find a way to reach out to these people. The, the courts, uh, all of the, the filings are public. Um, judgments are public. Most people have had to use a lawyer at some point in their lives. So we just need to figure out the right channel to reach the right people, depending on that practice area. And we really do feel that we'll be able to get them. And if they've had a bad experience, they'll be willing to talk about it. If they've had a great experience, they'll want to talk about it as well, because they'll want to recommend their lawyer. Do lawyers have, sorry, do lawyers have to have insurance? If lawyers, you, every lawyer is insured. So the question I have for you then is, um, there's a difference between legal advice and uh, legal information. So what type of insurance, or is there an insurance company that will insure you for legal information that you're providing on your website? Um, I think that question is best directed to the Law Society. Um, individuals here, I'm, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Thank you very much, Firm 30.